left in class and two chapters to cover. And we're really transitioning gears now to talk about the magnetic field. So we've been talking about the electric field, the whole class, you know, the last two weeks, uh, we have to talk about the magnetic field. So some of the ideas from electric field will, will carry over uh, to magnetic field. In particular, you know, the idea of superposition will be the same. Um, there are some ideas that are the same. And, um, so, just some announcements. So, chapter 29 is what we're beginning today on the magnetic, on the magnetic field. And your homework for chapter 29 will be due next Monday. Okay? Next week will be chapter 30 on electromagnetic induction. That homework will be due on the day of the final exam, which is Friday, March 20th. Here. In this classroom, from 10 to 1, so the end of finals week, uh, and for that, you're allowed to bring a formula sheet. You can bring two formula sheets. Um, let's say you had two from each of the midterms. Just, you can fill up two different sheets if you'd like. Uh, but you'll, so, about two chapters left, two weeks to go. So, <coughs> let's just dive right in to magnetic fields. And I have a picture here. Um, This, this, this picture right here is in your uh, textbook. But this shows the aurora. Uh, and the aurora occurs when high energy charged particles from the sun are steered into the upper atmosphere by the Earth's magnetic field. So we drew a picture in, in uh, last time, actually in the lab, of the magnetic field due to the Earth. And you'll remember that near the North Pole, the magnetic field lines are pointing almost vertical, like vertically in to the geographic North Pole, which is the magnetic South Pole. All right, so let me show you what this looks like. Okay, so here I have, we're gonna talk about magnetism now and so this picture right here shows what's called a magnetic dipole. And a real magnet, right, doesn't have, just like charge is not labeled plus or minus, we have to identify what is plus, identify what is negative, and we chose the electron to have negative charge. And then the, pot, and then, uh, the proton, for example, has opposite charge of that, right? So, so a <coughs> magnet, we call a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, those are just names, right? We could have called it up and down. There's, but there's the idea here is that there's two different kinds of poles, North Pole and South Pole. And this is called a physical dipole. Now, out of a North Pole, magnetic field lines uh, emanate outwards. So, if I was to draw it this way, is So we'll call this a physical dipole. As a north pole and a south pole, and you know, you just took a stamp and stamp one north and stamp one side south. So if I was to draw the magnetic field lines for the dipole, what you find is, well, first of all, how do we find magnetic field lines? Well, basically by using a compass needle. Right, and in this picture here, a bunch of compass needles have been placed all the way around this dipole. And the, and the compass needles, there's a small torque on them, 
and the, the amount of torque is proportional to the strength of the field. So the, 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 the compass needles align themselves with the local magnetic field. So you put a bunch of them out, and what you end up getting is a field that looks something like this. Okay, so some observations about the magnetic field is the field lines always leave the North Pole. So B is the symbol that we give for magnetic field. We use E for electric field, we use B uh, for magnetic field. And the units are Tesla. So they leave the North Pole and they enter uh, the South Pole. And just like the electric field, the strength of the magnet depends on how far you are from it. So if you're really close to the North Pole, you have a strong magnetic field, but if you're way out here, it's not as strong. Okay, that's why if I take two magnets, two bar magnets, they're more or less independent of each other, right? but if I bring them closer, uh, there is an attraction. So <clears throat> north attracts south. So just like electricity opposite poles, like apples that uh, repel. Okay, so let's see this. I'll bring two north poles towards each other. And it pushes the uh, red one away. But if I bring a north pole towards a south pole, Uh, there's an attraction here. Now, you might wonder, well, how is magnetism any different than the electric force? Why isn't it just the electric force? Well, uh, these bars are not charged. There's no charge on them, and uh, they still attract one another. So there's a few things that are different here. If I take, if I was to take a magnet here and and I was to move this compass around the magnet, you see the needle, the compass needle aligns itself with uh, the local magnetic field. So that's how you would map out the direction that the field points. <clears throat> All right, now if I was to take one of these magnets, and you might say, well, I just want a positive magnet or a negative magnet. So let's see. Okay, so I take another magnet and I say, all right, well, it repels this, this side repels this side, so this must be the North Pole. All right, so then I flip it over to this side. That side attracts, so it must, must be the South Pole. Okay, so let's try the same thing with this one here. Okay, so that must be the South Pole. Now, if I want to separate those two poles, you might think, well, let's just break it in half. Snap the magnet in half. But what turns out that happens is when you snap a magnet in half, you don't separate the north and south pole. You just create two new magnets. Um, and that's because fundamentally, the cause of magnetism is moving charge. So moving charge and it generates a B field. Okay, and there's two different kinds of moving charge. 
there is what we call a um, permanent magnet. And then there's current. And current is an electromagnet. So this has been known for thousands of years, but never understood until the last 150 years. But you can ore different kinds of material from the ground, um, different kinds of lodestones or magnite, and it has certain properties where these paper clips, you know, they're neutral paper clips, but uh, they, they attract certain metals, right? And what's happening here is these paper clips themselves are not magnets, but they become attracted, they become magnetized in the presence of a magnetic field um, due to this permanent magnet. Now this is a rather, you know, this, this definitely has a magnetic field, which you can see just by the fact that there's this force that picks up these, these paper clips. Um, now we could convince ourselves that there's no charge on this, it's not the electric force which is causing this because um, you know, well, we saw that typically if you have a charged object, it tends to lose its charge pretty quickly. So a rock that's just sitting there, um, it's not going to have any charge that's more, you know, stored up on it. So something's happening inside this to make the magnetic field. It's a pretty weak magnetic field, the ones that typically occur in nature, right? We can produce stronger um, magnetic, permanent magnets. Um, such as uh, neodymium magnets. Now ultimately, you might say, well, where's the moving charge in these ones? Ultimately, where the magnetism comes from here is uh, the motion of electrons. So if I was to picture microscopically, an electron as you know from chemistry that electrons are in orbitals, and electrons don't only really orbit, but they also have spin. So if I was to picture an electron as spinning, um, <clears throat> as far as we know, no one's been able to split an electron, right? Electrons are uh, fundamental particles, there's nothing smaller than an electron, you can't subdivide an electron, and an electron has what we call an intrinsic magnetic moment. Or, think of it this way, an electron is just a tiny permanent magnet. So it has a little north pole and a little south pole, and it, it does constitute current because it's spinning, it's a ball of charge which is spinning. Now that model is helpful for understanding what's happening inside a magnet, but I won't push it any farther because we really need quantum mechanics to really understand uh, magnetism in materials. But the idea is the electrons themselves are little permanent magnets. And when you have a bunch of electrons and their spins aren't canceling, they're all added together <laughs> in the same direction, that's how you get a macroscopic uh, magnetic field which you, can, which you can see its effects you know, by picking up uh, paper clips and uh, things like that. All right, so in the Earth, then, the Earth essentially acts like a physical dipole. The electron would be what we call a perfect dipole. Or a point dipole because its size is zero, but it has the same, you know, field shape as a physical dipole, but the north and south poles, they lie directly on top of each other. For a uh, physical dipole, you know, there's a physical size to the actual dipole, right? Um, there's an extension, you know, the north is at one side, the south is at the other, but for an electron, the north and the south are essentially right on top of each other. Um, all right, now, what happens inside? So 
What happens inside the Earth itself? Well, you can see inside here there is a, well, inside there is a uh, magnet, right? So it's, it's almost as if the Earth is looking like a, uh, a bar magnet. Now, inside the magnet, the field lines actually connect like this. So another property of magnetic field lines is that they all form closed loops. Uh, inside here, you have a bunch of electron spins, which are all aligning with each other. Right, and they all point in the same direction. That's what gives the magnetic field. So there is a magnetic field inside the material itself. And that causes all of the lines to form closed loops. That's different than electric field. Right, because electric fields, they begin on positive charge and end on negative charge. Uh, magnetic field doesn't begin or end anywhere. They always form closed loops. Right, but that's, but so in that sense, it's different uh, than uh, magnetic field. All right, but in, in some sense, this is the same because the force can be attractive or uh, repulsive. But it doesn't have to do with the accumulation of charge. It has to do with, fundamentally, it has to do with moving charge, charge in motion. Um, so it turns out that there's a deep connection, which we'll see um, next week, between electric and magnetic fields. And that's because, how do we know if a charge is moving? To someone, charge appears to be moving. But to another person, it appears to not be moving. So who's correct? But I still, I still experience a force. Right? So this is, this is where Einstein's theory of relativity comes in to really understand the connection between electric uh, and uh, magnetic fields. All right, so let's try an example here. So you take out your voting cards. seconds to explain to your neighbor what was what would happen to this compass needle near a positively charged rock. A couple arguments as to what you think is going to happen. Yes? Uh, I think it's C because it doesn't say that the charge is moving. Okay, so so the charge isn't moving, and I. Uh, now, what's the argument for A? <coughs> yes? Uh, the north is pushing and the south is pulling. All right, so now does this rod here have a north pole or south pole? Well, I mean, I guess really, you know, if you look on the microscopic level, there's a bunch of north and south poles from all the electrons, right? But they're all kind of randomly oriented. There's, there's no net 
you know, North Pole or South Pole. So there's no, this thing is not a magnet, it's just charge. So if it's just charge, charge doesn't attract a uh, compass needle. It doesn't attract a North Pole and a South Pole. You need two, only two magnets attract one, one another. So a North Pole doesn't attract or repel a positive or negative charge. Only, it only uh, repels a North Pole and a South Pole only attracts a North Pole or repels a South Pole. All right, now, so let's look at another example here where let's say I take two, let's say I take two different uh, uh, physical uh, dipoles. All right, I'll label it uh, north and south. All right, and I just I indicated three points in space near those magnets. So let's say, you know, so these two poles would uh, repel each other. Let's say I take another configuration here. And make this north and south. And this time I'll make it attractive. So south and north. So what I want you to do is sketch the B net at each point. Okay, so what it turns out is another property that magnetic fields share with electric fields is that they both obey the superposition principle. So B obeys superposition principle. Can someone remind us what the superposition principle is? Yes. All the forces acting on the same point add up the net force. Yeah, okay, so the net, we would say the net magnetic field at any point is the vector sum of the magnetic field due to each source, which was a similar idea for the electric field. So we're adding vectors together to get the total field. So work with your neighbor here. I'll give you a minute or two. At each of these points, sketch the relative magnitude and direction of the magnetic field of these. <coughs> Yeah. 
Okay, so let's go over this here. Is there any point in here that should be zero? Which one is that? The middle one on the very middle one on the top board. So zero magnetic field here. Now what about the top point? Straight up? Yeah, so this one, let me draw it down a little bit. Um, magnetic field that goes upwards. All right, and the way we can see that is, if we were to think of just one of the field lines coming out from the North Pole, and another one of the field lines coming out from this North Pole, their horizontal components will cancel, and you'll just get a net uh, vertical component that points up. What about the point over here? Uh, it's going to point something, you know, this one from this North Pole causes it to point away, right? And that one causes it to point away, so it's going to point something. Uh, it's hard to be exact here, but, you know, not directly vertical, but like an angle. One way or the other. Yes. So I don't know if this is like they ask, but like, do you mind like drawing a vector field for each scenario? Because I feel like that'd be easier to visualize this problem if you could like show what is exactly happening for everything. Yeah. So if we bring, so this is a good question because magnetic field really does have these properties, like. Just like electric field, um, you can store energy in your magnetic field. Your magnetic field can be compressed, can be under tension, um, and it has properties such as stress and strain. So if I erase these dots here, and I was to think about why two North Poles actually repel one another, well, each of these, each of these, uh, Field lines, uh, magnetic field lines are never going to actually cross. So what you have really happening here is when you try to bring these two magnets towards each other, you have, you're having to compress those field lines. So when, when those field lines become more and more densely packed, it turns out the energy in the field is proportional to the square of the field strength. So once those field lines become more and more compact, there's more and more potential energy stored in the field, and those magnets want to spring apart from each other. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Uh, whereas out here, there's not as much energy actually being stored. Now, on the bottom case, for example, if we were to draw the field, the field would actually point from north to south. Right, of course, I, now the field line diagram, whether it's magnetic or electric, is only a sampling of the underlying field. But we understand the field exists everywhere in space. Now, where this, these field, the field right here is, is uh, under tension, or sorry, under compression, the field here is under tension. Right? It's like rubber bands that have been stretched. So that the north and the south pole will lower their energy by pulling each other together by that field will release some of its energy by drawing those two magnets uh, uh, together itself. <clears throat> okay, so we would construct the net field by looking at the underlying, well, the superposition of the two uh, individual fields themselves. So then in this case, at the center point, there would be no, well, there would be a net field which would point this direction, right? Now, if I go up on the axis here, there's still a magnetic field to the right. It's just 
uh, not quite not quite as strong. And then over here, you know, you know it points into the South Pole and away from the North Pole. So we really have something that's going on like this. So your net field is going to be something kind of like that. Now, for a physical dipole, where exactly is the North Pole and where exactly is the South Pole? Is it right kind of, you know, is it right there at the tip? Well, that's why I call it physical dipole, because the poles of the dipole are really spread out over space. Right? There's, whereas an electron, it's really a point. So the North Pole and the South Pole coincide at a single point. Um, which really, to get a physical dipole, really what you do is you just put a bunch of these together, separated by a distance. Right? So intrinsically, the field created by a physical dipole is much more complicated than the field created by a perfect dipole. Right? Perfect dipole, just like, by the way, just like the, the electric field due to a point charge is simpler than the electric field created by a box of charge. That's more complicated, right? So a box of dipoles that's lined up, we call a physical dipole, is a more complicated field than a field of a perfect dipole. Although when you're away from the dipole, if you're really, really far away from the dipole and you can't really see the shape of it, or it's small compared to the distance you are from it, it looks, the field looks the same as a perfect dipole. Just like if you're really far away from a cube of charge, it looks like it's just a point charge. The, the, the actual shape doesn't really matter. It just looks like 1 over r squared there. <coughs> yes? Um, so is there like a, a center of uh, magnetism for a dipole or like a, I'm thinking like center of mass at which like gravity seat, uh, appears to act on an object? Is there something like that for this? Not really. Okay. Um, you know, we could talk about a, we could talk about uh, electric monopoles, isolated positive charges and isolated negative charges. But in magnetism, we can't talk about magnetic monopoles. That is an isolated north pole or an isolated south pole. They always come in pairs everywhere in the universe and there's a famous theorem which Dirac, famous physicist, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, Dirac proved, which showed that if we could find just one isolated magnetic monopole anywhere in the universe, we could prove why electric charge is quantized or it comes in little bits. But, you know, we can't. So it appears to be that it always comes in pairs. But theoretically, physicists want to be able to have isolated north and south poles because it would make the equations look more symmetric. Um, but that's one of the key differences between electric and magnetic fields is north and south poles always come in pairs. You can't separate the, uh, can't separate the pairs from each other. Fine. Good. Any other questions? So here's kind of, you know, we talked about the superposition principle. We have, um, we've looked at uh, permanent magnets. Right, and all right, I'm a, little, I'm a little too violent with some of the uh, demonstrations here, so I'm breaking them at the front as we go. But uh, so, so, anyways, unintentionally, of course. All right, so we looked at permanent magnets. Let's look at electromagnets now. Current, okay, current, because that's the other source. Uh, magnetism is, you know, moving charge that we can actually turn on or off. So while a permanent magnet will cause a compass needle to deflect, likewise, an electromagnet, now here is what we spent the last few weeks looking at is a battery is a charge pump which causes electrons to move to drift through the wire. Now, wires are electrically neutral. There's no net charge on a wire, but the electrons are all bumping their way with this drift velocity. It's a very, very slow drift velocity, a fraction of a millimeter per second, but you have you know, Avogadro's number of electrons moving. 
So that contributes to a lot of them moving, which is why you get a large field. So an electromagnet is a bunch of electrons <coughs> moving along, and, they, and their fields all add up together to produce really a, a magnetic field that looks very similar to a bar magnet. Now this is actually just a loop of wire, which uh, you can see how the magnetic field kind of swirls around the uh, uh, loop of wire here. And this originally was discovered by accident, where a physicist oops, by the name of Orsted about 150 years ago or so was doing an experiment and noticed that whenever he turned on the current, it caused the compass needle nearby to deflect all of a sudden. Right. So this was discovered by accident, but it turns out you know, this was part of the development of the theory of electromagnetism. So currents let me <coughs> sketch a current as such coming directly out of the board. So this dot refers to, imagine an archer and behind the wall with an arrow and shoots at the board from behind. So the tip of the arrow is just pointing out of the board. That's a way to remember the direction because we got to think about things in three dimensions here. So this is a current that's coming directly out of the board, a long straight current. Long straight steady Current. Just like with electric fields, it turns out it's kind of complicated when you move the charges around or shake them back and forth. Same thing for magnetic fields. We want a steady current or a current that's not changing. When the current changes, it complicates the picture a little bit. So we just want a steady, steady current of say one amp or you know one milliamp or something like this. Now, if I take a compass needle and put it around this wire right here, what you find is that the compass needle tends to align itself in these concentric circles. And the north pole of the compass needle always points in this direction and it gets weaker the farther you get away from the current. So we end up getting a magnetic field that looks like this. So here's the magnetic field and it gets weaker as you go farther out. Okay, so this, the magnetic field due to a long straight wire, we'll see where this comes from later on this week, but here's the magnetic field due to a long straight wire, which kind of, you know, let's just see whether or not this formula makes sense. I is just how much current you have. If there's no current, you have no magnetic field. Um, mu naught is the permeability of free space. Mu naught has a value of 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 tesla meter per amp, or you could write this as 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. So in a sense, we can think of this as the magnetic constant, just like we had an electric constant, uh, epsilon naught, which had to do with the permeability of, or sorry, the permittivity of free space here mu naught really measures the strength of the magnetic field. So as R gets larger and larger, the field gets weaker and weaker. So you might think that, you might remember for a line, a long line of charge, the field falls off 
as 1 over r. So similarly, for a long line of current, the field also falls off like uh, 1 over r. So we have kind of a, a uh, uh, similar, similar kind of behavior there. Yes? This is the cross-section of the wire? This is, yeah, a cross-section of the wire that is pointing out of the board like that. Okay, and on the right side of that, would the compass be pointing up or down? Good question. What direction would the compass be pointing? Yeah, up, up here. So let's just put, let's say I put the compass right here, for example. It wouldn't be up or down, but it would be aligning itself with the local magnetic field. So as I move it around, the compass still would twist around and bend itself to point in the direction of the magnetic field. So notice I put a vector sign here. The direction is given by the right-hand rule. And for current, this just means thumb is equal to the current and fingers a curl toward B. Or I should say, in direction of B. So how does that work? If I point my thumb in the direction of the current, my fingers curl around in the direction of B, like this. So that gives me the direction of the uh, field. All right, so take out your boarding cards. Let's try an example. So here's a long straight wire, which is not pointing out of the page, but it's pointing in the plane of the page at point P. What direction does the magnetic field point? Your moment here. Okay, so D is correct. <coughs> Our magnetic field points out of the page because if I point my thumb right in this direction, when I'm on top of the wire, the field points out. Right, but when I'm underneath the wire, it actually points into the board because the field circulates around the wire like this in this direction. All right, so let's imagine now uh, what would happen if I took this wire and I bent it into a ring. Imagine what the field would do. Okay, so I take that long wire and I bend it into a ring. So I want you to think quietly here about if I have a field that looks like this, what direction does that mean the current is moving in that loop? When you say clockwise, do you mean from a top view of the ring? Or from yeah, looking down, well, from your perspective here. So from your perspective here, you're looking down on the ring this way. All right, we'll take a vote here. Three, two, one. Okay, take a moment and try to convince your neighbor about what would happen here. Take what you know about the wire and imagine bending that field into a ring. Uh, 
consensus between A and B. We seem to agree that the current is flowing clockwise. So current is flowing clockwise is correct, right? Because if a current is flowing clockwise, I imagine taking my thumb in the direction of the current, um, my thumb would have to go around in this direction to give me a field which points downwards inside the loop. So here's what the magnetic field really looks like from the side view. If I imagine a current that's coming out here, right, and then wraps around back in on this side, inside the loop, the current points to the right. Outside the loop, it points to the left. And the strength of the field B, which we saw in lab, but I didn't prove for you. We'll look at where this comes from next time. But here's the value for the magnetic field at the center. That's just right at the very center of, of the loop. Right. We do expect it to get weaker as you come out this direction because the field lines are diverging. They're diverging away here but they're converging <coughs> into this side. Okay, so then can we determine what side must be the north pole and what side must be the south pole? Well, remember a north pole is this little loop of current. It, it could equally well be a little ball of charge which is spinning around. So it behaves like a little magnetic dipole with a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, the North Pole is going to be here, and the South Pole will be here on this picture because the field lines are diverging from the North Pole and converging into the South Pole uh, on this side. So then, what, what answer then must it be uh, a or B. Give you a moment to 30 seconds. Convince your neighbor A or B. We've limited it to A or B, but let's try to knock out the final one there. Because they're diverging. So A was number two. So let's say, yeah, number three. Let's have a nice side view away from each other. Yeah. Make sure that's where north is. All right, so let's take a vote. And three, two, one. All right, B is correct. Yeah, so the north pole is on the bottom because the bottom side of the loop is where the field lines are diverging. The top of the loop is where they're converging into, and that kind of is like a uh, soap pole. All right, so the, the loop of current really produces a magnetic field that's similar to a uh, permanent magnet or a, uh, a bar magnet, right? Uh, so it has a north pole and a south pole. 
An electron, we could picture like a little loop of current where the radius goes to zero and the current goes to infinity. That's one way to kind of think about it. Not entirely correct, but, it, but that's the idea of why it has a north pole and a south pole. Now one final point here is a wire, a long straight wire, has no north pole or south pole. And only when it's bent would it have a north pole and a south pole. All right, so we'll pick up there next day. Does that mean it's literally a fucking surprise? It behaves as it was. It's all. 
Oh, for a Tesla? Yeah. 